So we keep talking about how great um, capitalism is and how great all of this economic growth is and how we're ensuring equal access to everybody and making the world just a better place through all this innovation. And that's true in part. Um, living standards have increased over the past 200 years. That's great. Um, we all have fridges and iPhones and yay technology. Um, but that growth has not been equally distributed. Um, and so a really good example of this is um, this picture right here. Um, so I lived in Egypt for a couple of years. I did a master's degree at the American University of Cairo, which used to be located in downtown Cairo, right off of Tahrir Square, which is where the Arab Spring protests happened in 2011. It's kind of main downtown Cairo, these old buildings from the early 1800s. It was a really cool campus there. Um, but when I got there, um, they had just finished building a brand new campus um, that was like an hour outside of the city in a place called New Cairo. There was this brand new development. Um, this is what New Cairo looks like right now. Um, it's in the middle of the desert here, outside of kind of the main Cairo downtown metropolis area. Um, there is green grass and kind of these prefabricated buildings and stuff. When I was there, there was like nothing. There was the campus for the American University of Cairo, and that was all we had to take this bus that sometimes took up to two hours to commute out to the campus. Um, now it's more developed, but each of these developments here have, um, they're all gated and they have guards outside of each of the gates and each kind of neighborhood is responsible for paying um, for guard services. And it's, it's where most of the ultra rich in Cairo are moving to. They're leaving the main city and they're moving out into the outskirts, into these, these newer developments far away from the city. Um, and it's, it's because Egypt has had kind of lots of growth in, in their economy, but that growth has not been um, equally distributed. It's been a few people at the top, a few um, main companies that get government contracts and um, relatives of those um, um, those people working in those firms that are kind of benefiting from this, this economic development. The rest of Cairo, um, this is part of, or near downtown here, um, this is an area called the City of the Dead. This is an old Islamic um, graveyard here. You can see these different tombs here. And people live in the graveyards. Um, this is like the ultra poor kind of end up here. They're way locked out of kind of the new developments in New Cairo. Um, you can tell there's all sorts of anxieties by, from these rich people out here in the outskirts. They have all sorts of high security gates keeping people out. Um, they're afraid of having kind of the poor people come out to see the rich people. Um, and so it's a country that like everybody has faced the same kind of development and growth in GDP per capita, but it's wildly different um, depending on what kind, like depending on your job and depending on your economic circumstances. This story is not played out just in Egypt. It's played out all over the world. Um, even in the United States, we have rampant inequality where um, following the Great Recession in 2008-2009, um, the recovery from that um, on average has been great. Everybody's kind of back to normal um, from pre-recession times uh, before COVID-19 hit and destroyed everything. Um, but those gains were not felt by everybody. Um, lots of people got jobs back, but it was jobs working for Uber and driving for Lyft and kind of doing gig work and not doing like actual jobs with 401ks and kind of the standard middle class jobs. Those have been disappearing and shrinking um, in exchange for kind of the gig economy. Um, and so, but then there are other people who have been benefiting greatly from this gig economy. So you have like Uber executives and Lyft executives and other people who are um, profiting wildly. Amazon has been insanely profitable, especially um, in the world of COVID-19, um, where everybody has to order things online. It's just been fantastic for them, but awful for the rest of us. Um, and so these gains that you get from capitalism and technological growth are not kind of equally distributed and there are losers um and so what i what i'm calling this section here is one one and a half cheers for capitalism instead of three cheers for capitalism because yes it's providing great technological growth we have washing machines we have these great things that, that save us tons of time and kind of liberate us and it's fantastic but also bad things happen. Um, there's this inequality where not all of the gains from this capitalist technolo technological growth are spread equally, both within countries and between countries. 
Um, so this this chart here was in your in your reading. Um, it's actually a really ugly chart. I hate it because um, it's this 3D chart and it's really hard to read. Um, but what it's essentially showing or trying to show is um, these bars here that start at the beginning and go back towards the end. These are the um, the deciles of the population um, in the country. So this is like the bottom 10% of, of, of income earners and this is the top 10% of income earners. So each of these chunks represents 10% of people in the country. And so this is what inequality, the world of inequality looked like back in 1980, where if you were at a country like China, you had very low um, annual income here, low GDP per capita, but it was low all across the board. The highest earners, the guys way back here, they weren't earning terribly too much compared to the poorest earners. If you look at Brazil, um, their lowest earners were earning very low, but their highest earners were kind of back here. There was kind of some rich oligarchs here. Um, the higher the, the bars in the back is kind of the, the larger the wealthy class and the more money the wealthy class has. Um, and so this is what the world looked like in 1980, relatively flat, except you do have countries like the United States where that's a, like the, the top 10% of earners do have tons of money, um, but it's not like terribly tons. Um, but when we move to 2015, look how much the world changes here. Um, China, which used to be down here, is now up here. They're far richer than they were. Um, but if you look in the back, there's a massive chunk. Their top 10% of the country is earning like way more than half of the money that the rest of the country is earning. Um, if you look at Norway and the United States um, and kind of more developed countries here, there's massive inequality where the top 10% of earners are earning a ton of money compared to kind of the bottom 10% here. Um, another way of looking at this is like CEO pay in relation to the lowest earners or the median earners in a company. Um, CEOs by themselves are earning like hundreds of times more than any you know, of the average worker um, because these gains from capitalist growth are not being spread equally throughout um, or within all of these countries, but also across all of these countries. Nigeria has had all sorts of, they've benefited from all sorts of economic development. They have oil fields, they have all sorts of things. Um, but because of how the global capitalist market system works, um, they've had unequal access to kind of global markets. And so they're not as well off as uh, the United States and Europe and other, other wealthier countries. And there are a whole host of historical reasons for that. Um, the legacy of colonialism, the legacy of imperialism, and they're kind of down there at this end because of historical legacies. Um, and so there's all sorts of inequality within countries, but also across all of these countries. Um, within countries, this inequality is also um, very closely linked to other dimensions, um, specifically race. There's this fascinating whole research project by a guy named Raj Chetty, um, where he's dedicated his whole research agenda to studying inequality um, across all sorts of dimensions. And so in this paper, they're looking at um, racial dimensions. And what they find is um, that if you look at this first result here, um, black Americans and American Indians have much lower rates of upward mobility and higher rates of downward mobility than whites, leading to persistent disparities across generations. What that means is if you are born in the bottom 10% of income earners, if you're born into a poor family, Upward mobility means that you can move up to kind of the middle class or the upper classes um, or kind of higher levels of earnings. And what they find is white people are able to move up um, at slightly higher rates. It is hard to move up depending on where you're born, but um, compared to black and Native Americans, it is a huge stark difference. Um, what they find here, this is kind of the, the shocking finding from their study here is that controlling for parental income and a whole bunch of other confounders, black boys have lower incomes in adulthood than white boys in 99% of census tracts in the United States. So pretty much universally all around the country, um, black males are at a huge disadvantage compared to white males um, because of capitalist structures that have been built. Um, and the economic system that we have, which relies on labor from poorer people to prop up the whole economic system. Um, this, is, this became especially obvious during the um, 
early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, where essential workers were either medical workers, like doctors who were working in ICU units, but also the janitors providing the, the cleaning services for those, for those ICU units, and grocery store workers, and delivery people, and all sorts of kind of essential workers. Um, largely, um, those essential workers were um, Black and Latino Americans. And because of that, they were the most exposed to the coronavirus in the early days of the pandemic. And so in New York City, which was one of the main hotspots um, in the spring of 2020, um, over 60% of the COVID-19 deaths were um, Black and Latinos um, because they were the main essential workers that were the frontline people that had to keep working to keep the capitalist system going. Um, and that was like awful. And um, that's how the system has been set up um, over hundreds of years. And so one of the things we'll talk about in this class here is how we can help dismantle these systems that um, are kind of structurally set up to disadvantage specific groups of people. Um, we can use public policy to, to adjust for that, to um, um, not just adjust now, but also make reparations for the past. We can do all sorts of other, we have lots of policy levers that we can work with to try to improve these, these disparate outcomes here. And so this is one thing that like um, capitalism's not the greatest. It has all sorts of um, issues with inequality. So throughout the semester, we're going to explore a couple of questions related to this. Um, we're going to explore why capitalism is associated with growing inequality, and then how democracy can theoretically help curtail this, this inequality. Um, but even then, as we'll learn about in the next session, Democracy is not a silver bullet for this. Um, there are special interests and other um, trends in democracy that make it really hard to make any sort of policy changes because the rich um, are able to shape public policy in their favor, which then makes them richer and then grows inequality, and it's, it's not great. Um, so we'll talk about that throughout the semester. Um, so inequality, not great. Um, another issue with capitalism is that um, there's all sorts of environmental damage that comes from it. Um, if we remember from the beginning of the session, we talked about how firms take inputs and capital um, to create stuff. So inputs are things like money or natural resources and cap or and like um, that kind of, like actual raw materials, and then it uses labor or people to create stuff with that. Um, and when there are natural resources that just kind of exist out in the world, the natural tendency is to go get them and to, to overmine and to overforest and to um, overfish because it's just out in the world. Um, later in the semester, we'll talk about something called the tragedy of the commons, where it's kind of human nature to overuse stuff that is free because there's no cost to use it. Um, and so because of that, there's all sorts of environmental damage that comes from collecting the inputs, but also from producing the outputs. Um, if you look at carbon emissions over time, um, right around late 1800s, when we had this huge technological revolution that we talked about at the beginning of the class session for today, um, carbon emissions skyrocketed. And because of that, um, the CO2 in the atmosphere also skyrocketed. And then global temperatures have been rising um, constantly because of that. Um, but this is all because of technological change that's been spewing out more and more carbon. Um, and then the effects of this are also, going back to inequality, they're not spread equally. Um, th the people most vulnerable to climate change at this point are um, generally poorer people living on the coastlines, and they have no way of getting out of the coastlines because they can't sell their houses because nobody wants to buy their houses. They're going to be flooded in 10, 20 years. Um, and so again, kind of the costs of, of having all this environmental damage are not equally borne by everybody, and it disadvantages all sorts of people, and it's destroying the world, um, which is not great. So some other questions we'll explore throughout the semester here are, why is it so hard for democracies specifically to address climate change? Um, it's really hard for like the United States, even pre-Donald um, Trump, um, to agree on how to curtail um, carbon emissions. And we'll talk about why um, in other sessions in the future. And then we'll talk about can capitalist institutions even do anything to address, cap uh, to address climate change? Um, is there any sort of market-based magic bullet that we can use? 
Um, or do we just need public sector interventions? Or like, how do we even try to fix this with capitalism? And there might not be an answer. Um, capitalism might not be able to do anything to address climate change. There are schools of thought that just say the only way to fix the climate is to like abolish capitalism and change to a completely different system for um, providing goods and services to people. Um, and so we'll talk about that later in the semester and, and different ways of potentially approaching that. Um, so those are our one and a half cheers for capitalism. Yay, it creates lots of stuff, but leads to all sorts of inequality and environmental damage. So it's not um, all just perfect, shiny, happy unicorns. So capitalism.